Wells Fargo is proud to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in our employees, our customers, and the communities we serve, as well as through content on Carolina Impact. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on a special episode of Carolina Impact, we'll explore how innovation continues to shape our region. So can't get to the hospital? Well, how about the hospital coming to you? I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around, we'll show you how new technology and old-fashioned face-to-face care can help turn your living room or bedroom into a hospital room. From a sustainable coffee truck and outdoor fire pits, the Charlotte Innovation Barn is the city's newest hangout spot. But inside this old city garage is an incubator for sustainable businesses unlike any other in the country. We're going to take you on a tour. And from activist to gamer to nonprofit founder, meet a man creating apps to transport people back in time. Sort of. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. From at-home hospital visits to patient simulators for students, to new apps and cool ways to recycle, we're introducing you to advanced technology, creating new ways of doing things. Charlotte's Atrium Health is giving us a first peek inside their innovative hospital at home program. We'll meet the paramedics who are taking high-level hospital health care on the road and the patients who never have to leave home to get the care they need. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier is at Atrium Health with a story you'll only see on PBS Charlotte. Yeah, during a health crisis like the pandemic, it's ironic that one of the hardest things to do was actually see a doctor. Walk-in clinics were closed, treatments were canceled, even the hospital was overcrowded. But over time, Atrium Health figured out a way to expand and enhance their hospital at home program bringing more high-level hospital-type health care from their front door to your front door. Hi, Sabrina. <laughs> look at how good you look. He's Atrium Paramedic Chadwick Haggerty, visiting Hi. Atrium patient Sabrina Funderburg at home. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling better. I see you're still on the oxygen. Yes. What are we flowing right now? We're at two. We're at two. All right. Checking Sabrina's at-home oxygen levels. All right. And her blood pressure, all right there on Sabrina's sofa. You have any pain today? No. Headache. A little headache? Yes. Is it new? No. You feel good? You feel like you're back to where you were? All right, let's try it. Sabrina is part of Atrium's hospital at home program, treating patients in their own living room instead of a hospital room. You still feeling weak or is that coming back? Um, nope. So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. We'll walk through the hallway and then back down. Here at home is where patients are more comfortable, where they can be with their families 24 7 instead of just visiting hours, and where Sabrina gets hospital care without leaving the house. Personal care from her own personal paramedic. At least you're not stopping after every step. I know. <laughs> you're doing very good. <laughs> the ability to be at home with your loved ones um, in familiar surroundings, but knowing that you have the care you need um, when you need it, um, I think is the best of both worlds. Atrium's chief physician, Dr. Scott Rissmiller, adds that the hospital at home program also frees up more in-hospital beds, especially during COVID for patients who can't be treated at home. And it's a lifesaver for patients who don't have a nearby hospital or can't get to a nearby hospital. Uh, to serve our underserved, whether it be urban or rural, giving them access, going to them in their homes, in their communities. No one um, at Atrium Health wants to go back to the old ways. We now have these new tools that we can deploy and continue to build off of. We're bringing the hospital to them. Uh, you know, there's things that we do today in their home that they would have had to have been in the hospital to have done previously, which to me, I still can't wrap my head around. It's like, this is, why didn't we think of this years and years ago? For the hospital at home paramedics like Haggerty, the day starts at this Atrium Hospital Charlotte Supply Center, turning his paramedic SUV into sort of a high-tech hospital room on wheels. You know, we all think about 
you know, ultrasound machines is these big things that they roll around in the hospital. Well, this we just technically hook to an iPad and we can see the same things that they do in the hospital. We can do ultrasound IVs, things like that right in the patient's home, so. We can do 12 lead EKGs in their home and we can actually transmit them to the their file or to the physician can view them. Generally, uh, we can have up to four or five patients and with those patients we see them at least twice in most instances. All right, I gotta get my main supply box. We can actually draw blood at the patient's house and we can drop it right in the lab at the hospital. Hospital at home medics also have the same meds patients usually get in their hospital beds. This is our medication bag. We carry a massive amount of, of types of medications. Plus at home equipment that patients can use in some cases to take their own meds. Where they can put this in, they just press the thing and then they put this to their nose and take a big breath and their medication is administered. All right, so we're ready to go. We are really looking to take virtual and do a quantum leap in regards to the care we provide. Sort of that proactive 24 seven access in the home and deliver very high quality, high touch care in the home. Well, hello there. Hello. How you doing? I'm good, how are you? Good. Good morning. You looking good. Hospital at home patients like Sabrina also get house calls from their doctor while the paramedic is there. Do you feel very short of breath when you're up and moving around? Um, a, a little when I walk around. Face to face via mobile phone or tablet. Uh, how have you been doing with your open treatments? Have you been doing those pretty regularly? Yes, yes. Good. Good. With the paramedic taking notes for follow up. So you know the contact number, you probably know it by heart at this point. Yes. If you need anything, give us a call. Okay, I'm gonna be in the air. You have the medics that come and see you twice a day. You have the support of, the same support you have in the hospital, but it's a little bit more personal to me. They make you feel so good. Even though, like, if you're not having a bad day, they even encourage you, well, you know, that you're doing well. I feel pretty good about where she's at right now. You went through a lot but you still have the support of the hospital there to help you. So you're never alone and you feel, you feel, you feel confident and you feel safe. Atrium's hospital at home program also has a 24 seven nurse hotline that patients can call anytime for uh, help or advice, sort of like that call button for the nurse that you have in your hospital room here at uh, CMC and those high-tech monitors we saw during the story that let uh, patients check their own blood pressure and oxygen levels and uh, heartbeat, well, they can also be monitored here at the hospital. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. Atrium Health says as of October, they've treated about 59,000 patients through their hospital at home program. That includes both acute care patients with paramedics like we just saw in that story and observation only patients who communicate daily from home with Atrium nurses at the hospital. You can learn more on our website at pbscharlotte.org. With the need for healthcare workers still in high demand, a new simulation center is giving students hands-on experiences. Central Piedmont opened its Leon Levine Health Science Center last year with some pretty amazing new technology, but the center hadn't really been utilized because of COVID and remote learning until now. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis takes us inside the control room that's helping launch careers. But you can see it's starting here on the ribs and then it's rolling around to the back. It's the cutting edge of healthcare technology. But then we have middle trapezius and where's its line of pull? Brenda Cannell teaches her occupational therapy students at Central Piedmont Community College by using the most advanced innovation. When our students get ready to go out to clinicals, we don't want them to walk into a hospital room and go, oh, this is what a hospital room looks like. Oh my goodness, there's too many machines. I don't know what to do. That doesn't work. Brenda's class is taking place at the new Leon Levine Health Science Center. It's a game changer for students. In so many ways. We were told that we were building a new building and we had an opportunity to build a SIM center. SIM stands for simulation, and the entire fourth floor of the new building is filled with the latest in simulation technology, giving healthcare students a preview of real life experiences. The other thing that doesn't work is only practicing on your classmates because your classmates are the most cooperative patients you're ever gonna get. 
Nursing students hone their skills in rooms simulating an operating room, because birthing what? center, mother and child simulation room, and trauma rooms. And each is equipped with high-tech dummies, which are more like robotic mannequins. They talk, yeah, yeah. It's Miss Scott doing the talking, usually, through the patient, so it's, it's really cool. Here, we're giving different scenarios that may not occur as a student while we're in the hospital, and I just feel like we're given a lot of freedom to make mistakes or ask questions. She is now in labor 36 weeks and she's had a small abruption. Which is Instructors like Lisa problem, Scott right? can the teach in class the or sit just outside the simulation rooms in glassed in control rooms. They can watch on monitors, record the sessions, and over the intercom toss out various real life scenarios for students to deal with and hopefully learn from. Ow, I have a contraction. Oh, Ow. Let me, let's, let me put on gloves. So this is our labor and delivery room and we have Victoria, a high fidelity mannequin who can actually birth a baby. You can control the rate that she crowns. Um, you can control how much screaming you want the parent to have. So assimilation really helps because, you know, we get to actually visualize um, the patient. You know, they, they're breathing, the, they're, you know, you can see what's going on their vital signs are up. And um, I feel like I've learned how to assess a patient much more rather than just seeing the information, like what's normal, what's abnormal. You know, you're getting to see it in real life. With students taking turns in the simulation birthing room, the rest of the students are back in the classroom, watching on monitors and taking notes. Afterwards, they all discuss the things they did well and what they can improve on. The worst part about it <laughs> is um, you're being filmed, like your classmates are watching you. So I think, you know, we're all going in they're a little nervous. We're not out to get the student. We want them to make their mistakes here. The ability to reflect on them, their own performance and see really how, how they engaged with the patient. How did they speak to it? Did they make eye contact? All of that is something that through watching yourself you learn and that's very different than somebody else telling you you did or didn't do something. Nursing students working towards their two-year associate's degree to become a registered nurse can expect some good paying jobs. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the average registered nurse salary in the United States is over $77,000. However, in the Carolinas, those numbers are slightly less, with South Carolina ranking 40th among the states in pay, with an average RN salary of about $65,000. And North Carolina ranks 37th, with an average RN salary of more than $66,000. The average for new grads entering the workforce in North Carolina is just under 62,000. We really believe we've done it as good as anybody. Um, we had a consulting firm who specialized in healthcare help us design this fourth floor. We designed it so that it allows us not only to meet our current needs, but our future needs. The Sim Center also has a pharmacy, clinical lab, and check this out, an actual apartment where students simulate physical therapy and what it's like to navigate an in-home type of setting. The number one goal is to give students a better hands-on experience and to create better prepared graduates for the workforce, which will ultimately better serve the healthcare needs of the community. So I think what we're gonna see are more comfortable and confident students who have a better understanding of everything because they've seen it inside and out. More prepared than I would be if I didn't have this experience. Providing state-of-the-art education so in a field that's only thing. expected okay. to continue growing. Okay. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Turzis reporting. I just always marvel at what technology can do. Thanks so much, Jason, for sharing that story with us. The simulation center required an investment of more than $1 million. It was also designed to become an on-campus clinic so students could one day see patients there. Every 17.3 seconds, North Carolinians throw away enough plastic bottles to reach the height of the Bank of America building in Charlotte according to the State Department of Environmental Quality. In the Queen City, only 11.5% of the materials that currently enter Charlotte's waste system each year are recycled or composted. But the city is working to change that, partnering with the nonprofit Envision Charlotte to open a cutting edge incubator for sustainable businesses unlike any other in the country. Carolina Impact's Rochelle Metzger takes us on a tour of the Innovation Barn. With a large outdoor space, fire pits, and rocking chairs, the Innovation Barn in Charlotte is a great place to sip a drink and enjoy skyline views. Just be sure to bring your recyclables, because just inside this old city garage is a cutting-edge incubator for sustainable businesses and zero-waste initiatives. We're the first of its kind in the country to have an innovation center focused on the circular economy. 
What is a circular economy? Amy Osaker, the executive director of Envision Charlotte, explains it like this. So a linear economy is what we are now. So we buy something, we use it, and we throw it in the landfill. Linear. So a circular economy is like a forest. So if a forest has a tree, it grows up, it dies, falls on the ground, it rots, renutrients the ground, there's zero waste. So if you think about it, it's a zero waste society. Osaker shows us the plastics lab where takeout containers can be turned into filament. Filament can be used in 3D printers. They also have a glass pulverizer that turns wine bottles into sand. Just drop it in there. So you have the little tiny fine sand, a little bit bigger. Around the corner is a sustainable furniture shop that reduces waste by repurposing local Carolina trees. So we count the rings, we know how old it is, we know where it grew. Carolina Urban Lumber makes dining and coffee tables, floating shelves and mantles at a workshop in Pineville and sells them here. We knew the tree didn't get cut down for us making furniture. Founder Damon Barron says a vast amount of wood waste is sent to landfills on a daily basis. He knew there were better uses for old natural resources, and so Carolina Urban Lumber was born. Like This is a prime example. This does not get into the bulk lumber industry where we get two by fours or flooring. This is so disfigured and ugly as a log that it gets trashed. But to me, this is, this is prime material. Barron says he's proud to be a part of Innovation Barn where people are striving for common goals. So these plants are different varieties of lettuce. This is Charles Oliphant shows us the produce being grown using a system called aquaponics, a method of farming that raises edible freshwater fish, tilapia in this case, and vegetables together in a symbiotic environment. Aquaponics is a process whereby the fish produce waste and it's converted by bacteria into nitrogen fertilizer for the, for the plants. The plants then clean the water, which goes back to the fish. Oliphant is with 100 Gardens, an organization that builds aquaponic programs in schools, institutions, and communities of need, teaching people how to grow food while conserving water. So aquaponics uses approximately a tenth of the water of soil-based agriculture. The system will produce about 300 heads of lettuce a week, which will go to restaurants and food banks in the region. You don't have to understand the whole thing about how it works to make it work, and that's why it's so great for education. Educating people and changing the way they think about their food is the mission of 100 Gardens. Then they'll learn how to prepare it in the teaching kitchen across the hall. The kitchen features four stations with double induction ranges donated by Electrolux. Residents can sign up for cooking classes on how to limit food waste and canned vegetables. Folks in Charlotte love their beverages. That's where Repour Bar comes in. Folks will be able to come in, sip on a craft beer or a glass of wine and learn how they can make the city more sustainable. The circular economy continues with Mush, an urban mushroom farm that harnesses the power of fungi to reduce waste that the mushroom actually grows underground and is actually what you can see on the whites in the bags behind me. And really what that does is that's breaking down uh, wood and waste that we have in our environment. Mush's Josh Partridge was brought in to run the Innovation Barn's mushroom operations. Currently, he's repurposing wood shavings from Carolina Urban Lumber to produce gourmet and medicinal mushrooms for purchase. Our plan for mush is to grow two types of mushrooms to start off. They are oysters mushrooms and lion's mane. Just steps away is a composting lab that employs soldier flies to decompose food waste. So they're all in here eating, these are a bunch of edamame peels and potato skin. A local food waste diversion group runs the lab. This is all uh, household stuff. We just started this bin last week. We've got about uh, 5,000 black soldier fly larvae in here. David Valder with Crown Town Compost says black soldier flies are important for Charlotte's circular economy is they're really good at converting food waste into protein that's good for animal feed. So we're keeping that in the loop instead of letting it go to the landfill. Eventually, the black soldier flies will be harvested and fed to the fish at 100 Gardens. Through this process, Valder says nothing goes to waste. About 200,000 tons of food waste per year in Mecklenburg County alone. Food waste in a landfill is, breaks down with no oxygen and that results in methane production, which is a greenhouse gas. And eliminating greenhouse gases is the ultimate goal. Reducing climate change. Fundamentally, full stop, that's what we have to do. A monumental task that begins one bottle at a time.
For Carolina Impact, I'm Rochelle Metzger. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Future plans for the Innovation Barn include programming partnerships with local universities and corporate partnerships for product development and education. They also hope to launch a monthly speaker series and offer classes to teach people about things like vertical farming and home repairs. Well, a Charlotte activist has found a way to merge his passion with technology to create unique apps. Now those apps are helping organizations like the Levine Museum of the New South and Solid Waste Management connect with users to entertain and to educate. Carolina Impact's Sarah Cologne Harris introduces us to this innovative mastermind. These signs that you see here, we worked with the Levine Museum of the New South and the Charlotte Department of Transportation to get these installed. When it comes to the latest app he designed, Michael Zhukov can't stop talking. You can actually download the app, uh, and the app is called No CLT. No CLT is in K-N-O-W-C-L-T. The massive project commissioned by the Levine Museum of the New South connects players to Charlotte's historic Brooklyn neighborhood using augmented reality. You run into this you know, location, you say, hey, I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna go to as many sites as I want. You can freely do it as you, as you please. But you'll notice there's also footprints installed on the ground. It works like this, download the app, Stand on the footsteps at any of the seven sites in Uptown Charlotte, point your cell phone at a target, and voila. So right now, that image faded over it. You've been transported in time through photos and oral histories. And this one's really incredible because you can see the pre-existing buildings here, and you can see there is J.T. Williams home. J.T. Williams, a prominent teacher, physician, and diplomat, once lived in Charlotte's black community known as Brooklyn in the early 1900s. The community of about 7,000 people forced out by the city in the 60s after nearly 1,500 homes were deemed blighted. You know, the fabric of a community was basically severed through this process of urban renewal. The app is part of the Levine Museum's new digital effort to merge technology with history. We want to meet people where they are, right? And everybody's on their phone, everybody's online, and um, we want history to be more accessible. The people at the Museum of the New South have done an amazing job is collecting so much different information to show the full diverse experience of life that was here. The cultural experiences, the political experiences, the economic experience, that this truly was the heart of of Black Charlotte. As a former history teacher, activist, and avid gamer, bringing the app to life through his nonprofit Potions and Pixels is a dream come true for Michael. Our whole um, mission is to utilize games to create social impact. And so with the games that we've created, the events we've hosted, the workforce development projects, the camps for the youth, that's our way of using interactivity, art, technology, and gaming to, to better our community. Sounds fun, but the journey required a test of courage. After leaving his full-time job in late 2019, Michael stumbled into 2020 as a social entrepreneur. It didn't take long, though, for the word to get out. 2020 was an interesting year to pursue something full-time. We had a, a number of hurdles to get through, but I'm super excited about where we are right now. He says the No CLT app took about three months to produce, requiring a team of designers, developers, and artists. The app is based on utilizing GPS, so, which is wild to think that our app here is utilizing satellites in, 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 the, in, the, in the space. Um, but GPS, um, gyroscopes, um, accelerometers, um, we have a custom server that we created. The complexity of the projects has attracted the interest of other organizations looking to connect with their audience through technology. Potions and Pixels recently partnered with Charlotte's Solid Waste Services to create the Trash Dash app. I wanted to do something that actually put our uh, consumers in the role of actually having to run the operation. Using a raccoon as the main character, the app allows users to learn more about their trash pickup services, creating more awareness and even a little empathy for the job. I call this bridging the empathy gap, helping people better understand the, the roles and the work that other people in our community do. I think they get a chance to do it and then they get addicted and they want to get a better score. And so I think it continues to keep them thinking and strategizing about what they can do to help improve um, what we do. And so the facts that we include in there, I think help give them an idea of what they can do to help support uh, better running operations. 
and there's perks, 15 of them. By customizing the operation, users can unlock faster trucks and recycling programs. That's been really fun, just seeing different players in the community. I'll oftentimes run into people and they'll whisper to me, what are the best perks? I want to know what the, the perks I should have. For Michael, it's all more than he ever hoped for. His life pursuit of developing games finally coming into focus. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sarah Colon Harris reporting. Just another example of a super cool app. Well, thanks, Sarah, for sharing that with us. That's all we have time for this evening. We hope you enjoyed this innovation special. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Production of PBS Charlotte. Wells Fargo is proud to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in our employees, our customers, and the communities we serve, as well as through content on Carolina Impact.